Lucy Pellegrini. I'm the chaplain here at Helmport. I'm in my 16th year here, part time. Um, and so, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is an initiative in part uh, of the Compassionate Care Coalition that um, has been developing over the past year and a half. It's brought together people who work at Porter Hospital, at Helen Porter, and at the satellite offices, and Addison County Home Health and Hospice. All in an, an effort to try and um, encourage people to talk to one another, to use the same language when we talk about end-of-life care, so that palliative care one place doesn't mean some, something totally different on another side of the county. And as we become more and more Porter Hospital as a, as a health care system, rather than separate buildings all over the county, that'll become more and more important so that we have a common lexicon. One of the papers that I gave you is uh, a piece that was written by a man named Ira Baya, a doctor. He's now at Dartmouth Hitchcock, but he was one of the leading proponents of, um, of hospice care long before hospice was even identified in this country. And he talks about the importance of community, the importance of everyone in a community doing end-of-life care, of being there as a person is dying. And I don't think person-centered care becomes more evident than when we are trying to care for those who are moving through, who are much closer to the end of their lives than the beginning. Um, this is a colorful diagram sort of showing whether you call the person a patient, a resident, or a client. There is a whole group that supports the care of those people. And no one person is more important than the other. Some people are reimbursed or have reimbursable services, but those reimbursable services, in other words, they can they get paid, or the, the payments coming into the facility are based on what they do. They wouldn't get paid unless there was a whole circle all working together for the same type of care. All delivering the best care possible. And that's actually one of the titles or a title of one of the books that Arubaya wrote, The Best Care Possible, which is what everybody wants at the end of their life. They don't want sort of a fly-by-night operation. They want a concerted effort to really be very present and to have them be the center of what is going on. So you have, and I'm sorry if I'm not using the politically correct terms, but I'm old. Uh, housekeeping, um, physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs, laundry, dietary, social services, activities, PT and OT, administration and office staff, nursing, LNAs, maintenance, all of those things come into taking care of, of somebody at the end of their lives. Now, we can do or offer just extraordinary care, but if we goof up the end of life care, that's what a family will remember. That's what they carry away. We can, we can have been there and been there and been there, but if we're not there in those final days or those final months, then, then we've really not provided total person-centered care. So, how would how, define palliative care? Anybody? Somebody? Comfort. Death with dignity. Of course, that's a buzzword, but um, we talk about palliative care being relief of suffering. And that's not just in one area, and I'm going to try 
try and turn this without knocking the spring off the wall. We talk about palliative care being relief of suffering, and we talk about it being relief of suffering in four separate domains. The physical, so what does that involve? What else? What else does it involve? Pain control. That's another part. Staying in bed, patient choice is important in terms of the physical. Um, getting them back to bed if they want to go back to bed. Making sure that the room temperature is what is going to keep them comfortable. And that, it, that goes well beyond just, just being in a facility. That kind of relief of suffering and in the physical means adequate pain control. It means if um, someone is a diabetic, perhaps they don't need to test quite as often. It means addressing breathing issues. It means being aware that if the weather is really warm, if, that somebody with COPD is not going to be very comfortable. So sometimes it's helping families understand that. It's, under, it's helping families understand that maybe physical therapy is not what a person needs. It may be what the family wants, but it may not be what the person in the center of that circle truly needs. Um, relief of suffering emotionally. The opportunity to talk about your end of life. And that is very difficult for families to handle. And, and I've worked with a number of families who've said, well, don't tell them anything. And tried to keep the family from doing anything but sort of being a cheerleader. Like win one for the gipper here. Meanwhile, the person in the center of the circle is, knows what's going on, and by not talking about it, what happens? You're isolating that person. You're putting them in a bubble. And, pardon me. They lose all their control, and the control goes to the family of whoever is making those decisions. So that emotional um, well-being, that sense of not being alone, is very important. Um, whether you're out in the community or in a doctor's office or over at the hospital or here. That sense of abandonment is critical. To avoid that sense of abandonment is critical. Mental and cognitive. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Confusion. Um, confusion may enter into it, but it's basically allowing the person in the center of the circle to have all the information that they can use to make decisions. Now, if someone doesn't have decision-making capability, you're not going to go through a whole, you're not going to go through the whole prognosis. But the family may be making decisions, particularly for an Alzheimer's related or cognitive impairment of some kind. The family needs to have that information. And withholding that information is, is abusive. And it doesn't mean that you sit them down and you give them every book that covers every contingency, but it means that you answer the questions to the best of your ability. And it may mean if somebody says, this person perhaps doesn't know why I'm here. The famous story is of a wife sitting with her husband, coming 
devotedly, and it wasn't here, but coming devotedly every day. And she said to her husband, I love you. He was far, he was in the last stages of Alzheimer's. And she got up, walked down the hall, down another hall, down another hall, through the door, got in the car, and a, an aide was in the room and heard him say, I love you too. So sometimes the information we can give is that the processing is going on somewhere at a very deep level. And that time is what they need. Spiritual. A lot of times the person in the center of the circle has a lot of questions. And sometimes it's easier if you're not comfortable with them, with those questions see if you can get their pastor. They don't need an immediate answer. You know, see if a pastor could come call the chaplain, call someone who's got a little more experience. One thing that is not necessarily helpful, well, let me back up. For the person in the bed, particularly if they're elders, and they may have been the person who baked all the pots, who read the lessons, who cut the grass, who taught the Sunday school, who made sure that the pastor's car would start when it stalled out in the parking lot. They were there all the time. But once they, are, they feel once they're no longer able to do those things, their church is not there for them. They lose that community. People who are elders lose the ability sometimes to manage their medications so that morning, early morning on Sundays, the, is too early for them to get to church. So they feel their parish has abandoned them, and if their church has done that, if that community has done that, has God done that as well? It causes tremendous grief. And the other thing is, people start thinking maybe God is punishing me for something. I don't believe in a punishing God. I believe in a loving God. And I believe that God is present through all of us to offer the care that the person in the center of that circle needs, and that we reflect that care. We reflect that love, that compassion. One of the prayers I always say is, may you see the love, the compassion of God reflected in the touch, the words, the eyes, the presence of people who work in this place. So know that you are are doing that every time you're with somebody. You're reflecting that and giving them a sense that they're not alone, that they haven't been abandoned. So those are the four domains. This is the best care possible to address all of these. Now, no one person is able to do all these. No one is perfect. And sometimes, some days we're better able than others to get to our effort, to, to do all that we would like to do. It's hard when we can't, but we give the best care we possibly can on that day. So this, the one from Aya Baya, the discussion book from Ira, talks about community and how community functions at end of life. The other paper that you have one with the two columns, talks about types of care and how we use those terms. There is no one, as I look around this room, there's probably no one who is not receiving palliative care for something. It's not a dirty word. 
What it needs is relief of suffering. I wear contacts and bifocals, so I'm wearing trifocals. My eyes are never going to be the way they were when I was seven years old. Not happening. A lot of us have aches and pains. We have arthritis. Arthritis isn't something that's cured. We get that as we go on. We're getting palliative care for that so that everybody is having palliative care for something. It doesn't mean that we're, not, that we're dying anytime soon. It just means that we're having relief of suffering. We've been told what's going on. If we were really upset about it, we were given a hug by our parents or by a nurse or um, by the person who checked us out. We, our pain was relieved, and if we had questions about why is God doing this to me, we have a pastor or, or a priest who could support us through that. So palliative care is an overarching type of care. We all, if, you're, if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, all of those things are being covered under palliative care. It is different from curative care. It is a, it's different from aggressive attempts to change the course of an illness. And probably the best way to look at that is, is a cancer diagnosis. There is aggressive um, diagnostic work going on. There is testing. Um, whether it is x-rays or blood testing, there are treatments. All of, all of that is curative care. Later on in life, we probably are moving more towards palliative, more palliative care and less curative care. We have pneumonia, we want antibiotics. If we have, um, if, if we have chronic Destructive pulmonary disease, we want something to alleviate those systems, those symptoms. But we may become more less and less active, and that may be another way to lessen those symptoms. Once we a lot of our folks here are still getting blood pressure medication, insulin, um, a variety of medications to keep them going. And you can see in the one column, the column on the left, there are different situations that occur during the course of someone's later years or late or increasing incapacity that indicate to caregivers and to the hospital or here that maybe they're closer to a comfort care or a hospice type care situation. And you can see what they are, increasing falls, less interest in, in activities, um, playing cards or coming to bingo here, maybe less interest in going to church. All of those things are, are things that indicate that there's been a change here. If you're in housekeeping, and when you went and, and cleaned that room here, and the person was always out of the room, and suddenly you're seeing them more and more often, that's an indication that there's been a change there. And it's okay to say to a, to a nurse or to an LNA or a social worker, this seems different. They never used to be in their room at this time in the morning. It's, that is something that the clinical staff may not have picked up on. You're part of a team. We're all part of a team. Um, you know, if I go to see, if, if someone has been at services every single week, and then they stop coming, or they leave early, to me, that's a sign there's something else going on. And, and I'm the only one who's going to know that. Um, most of the rest of the staff aren't, aren't going to have that sense that that's happening. So it's up to all of us to communicate 
when there are changes like that. There are two kinds of hospice care. There's hospice with a big H, which is the hospice benefit. And that means there's been a diagnosis that the end of life will probably occur in the next six months. That's one of the requirements to have that. Hospice to care means that all the medical services will be covered. Does not mean that the caregiving costs will be covered. So when someone is self hospice with a big age, it's important to know that they've signed on for the hospice benefit. Hospice type care, comfort type care is what also can be offered. That means that the nurse is the hospice nurse is not the one who is coming in on a regular basis. And if and people choose that because they can't afford to pay for the room. So that is one reason why some we say are they on hospice? We mean the hospice benefit. Hospice type care is comfort care. It's it's palliative care relieving the suffering that is is identified as end of life. So it can be confusing, but it is a method, it is a protocol, it is a praxis that leads us to offer relief of suffering at the end of life. At, and you'll see the second, the other column is talking about that big end of life. When that happens, you'll see over here, you see a purple or a lavender um, name plate go up. Over at the hospital, it's a, is it a butterfly or a flower? I don't know. I think it was an effort. Butterfly? A bird? A bird? Okay. Over here, it's just, it's a purple name tag. And what those indicate is that someone is doing some really intentional, serious, hard work in this world. End of life is hard work. It's labor. And it means that you don't have conversations about uh, the Patriots or the Giants or the Yankees or the Red Sox standing right outside that room. They don't need to know that. They might, you know, they might have enjoyed it, but they don't need loud voices. It means put the drop the voices if someone is very agitated and calls out and you don't park their wheelchair right outside that room. You're trying to give the person all the time and space they need to do the hard work that they're doing. And once the, once the resident and the family has decided, I don't want to go to the hospital again, I don't want any more diagnostic testing, I don't need any more x-rays, I don't want antibiotics, I don't want a routine finger stick, I want to eat ice cream every day, or three times a day. I want to walk out in the garden. I want to be comfortable, and that's my goal. I want relief of suffering. Then we consider that they're an action of the life. And that's when we, people may move into the estuary or to the arch rooms. There are three arch rooms here. Someone may sign up onto hospice in the community. And that involves getting in all of the, like the hospital bed and commode and special equipment that might be necessary. So each, each entity within the county goes through some changes when someone is in the end of life. Family becomes very important. And I know that hospice, big H, as a county home health and hospice, works very hard to take care of the family, as we do here, as the practices do. 
they are concerned about how the family is weathering this. We see families who are so devoted in this place, and we never see some families. It's hard when you see that happening. It's hard not to be judgmental. It's hard because you don't know what happened in the rest of their lives. We have some parents who have been everything for their kids, but when their kids need them most, they're gone. We have some people here who we think are the most wonderful people in the world. Outside these walls, not so much. Outside these walls, they manage to alienate some of their kids and others, for whatever reason, are devoted. We just don't know the backstory. It is okay for families to leave. Sometimes they need to to be able to do the work they do. And it's okay for the resident to be alone sometimes. The, one of the books that we hand out is this one. It is a book that talks about the similarities between death and dying and giving birth. It talks about what hard work it is. And we all know that some people want to give birth with the whole community in the room and others want to crawl under a rock and give birth. It's the same thing with death and dying. Some people want their whole family there. Some people want the privacy of being alone. It is a very personal decision. And sometimes allowing families to leave gives the person in the bed the space and the time and the peace to do what they need to do. When someone goes on to active end of life here, anybody can look and see there should be one of these folders in their, in their room. This came about because of an end of life collective <coughs> that we started seven years ago, eight years ago. Roxanne, I think, is the only one here today. Izzy's gotten a lot of the information about it. But this was put together by people in this place. Administration, maintenance, our, the head maintenance guy put together a checklist because nursing said there are so many things we want to do, but we have to check to make sure the meds are there. We have to do all the we have to get the orders right. We have to do all these things. We can't do the little things. And so there's now a checklist that allows other people to come into that circle and help. Um, inside this, inside the folder is this book, and we give one to each of the families. I would suggest it as something for everybody to read. In terms of one of the things that it, the checklist does, it sort of specifies that maintenance can be, can be asked to find a reclining chair that is just for families of those who are dying. And it, it ought to be on wheels, it's not, but it's a recliner. It can be clean and it often it, it's all over the facility. We ask maintenance to find fans. We know they fill bird feeders. They find extra seating. We have a pull-out couch we put in your room. Dietary. Food is love. Changing that food to a consistency that the person can enjoy is important. Finding out what things really bring them comfort is important. If you know that resident always wanted ice cream and maybe couldn't have it because they had something else going on at end of life, it really doesn't matter. If weight loss we're not worried about or building you know, too much weight we're not worried about. Comfort at every level is what we're thinking about. 
they're also they also make sure there's a comfort cart um, down in the room when family is there. We have a cafe in separate areas. We offer families meals. The LNAs recheck the checklist. They have considerations for the family. They're involved in noise reduction, pointing out to families that the community room here, that they can use the big screen TV. All of those things are important because taking care of the family is one of the worries of the person in the bed. And if mom was always in charge of that and she can't do it anymore, knowing that her family is cared for is important. Housekeeping, just keeping the room clean, the floors clean, the beds, the beds um, swept under, getting rid of the dust puppies, all of those things, the bedside table being clean, all of those things, especially if the woman, if the family really insisted on every surface being immaculate, it's a big help if we can do that for them. And of course, nursing is doing charting and coordinating care and administering meds. And the laundry can make sure that the favorite things that that person has been wearing is, are also there. All of those things are important. Or if something has disappeared, you know, bending over backwards to find those things. Person-centered care means that we're all responsible for communicating with one another and communicating with the person in the bed unless it is an invasion of privacy. If you've always said good morning to the person in the bed, don't stop because of her name that goes up. That's a connection you can. Do you have any questions about that? Comments, sermons, anything? Collaborative work also means that you take care of each other. It also it means that you realize that when someone dies, it's painful for us. Whether you work in an office and that patient isn't going to come anymore, whether you work at, whether you're a caregiver at home, checking in with that person is important or whether you're here. Um, when you are working in one of the facilities, sometimes saying goodbye at the end of your shift can be the best thing you can do. If that person dies and you haven't said goodbye, sometimes it can cause a lot of guilt. And we all carry enough of that without any extra. Um, once someone dies here, we leave the bed, spread, cleaned up, chucks pulled out, any two beds, all of that sort of debris out of the room. We don't scrub the room down. We put a quilt over it and we decorate the bed so that when the family comes in, they can see that we're on their loved one. Um, I've seen family members walk into a room and burst into tears because the favorite baseball hat is there, the picture of a favorite grandchild is there, their flowers there, or the stuffed animal they want to big go and they always treasure is on that bed. And the LNAs are the ones who know that stuff. They're the ones who you know, we have a we have a resident who, if that resident were in the bed, wouldn't know it if the menagerie she has from Bingo is still on the bed. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's knowing which part of that menagerie is the most precious that makes a difference. Also, one of the most important things we can remember is that the word silent an anagram for listen. 
the same letters are in silent that are in the word listen. And it's important to be silent in the, in the presence always of, of the patient, the client, the resident. But especially in the especially when we're doing palliative care. Um, and, and sometimes the one or two words that someone will say are the most meaningful conversation you will have. Once um, someone has died, it's important to talk to someone within keeping HIPAA who can't really go home and talk about that. This is our community. This is our support right here. And it's okay to say to somebody, I need a few minutes right now because I'm just dying really long time. It's okay to ask someone to cover for you. So you take a few deep breaths, um, go get a glass of water, um, stand outside and look out into the hill. All of those things can help you to heal, but it's important to take that time and know that, that we all grieve every single loss. Even if the person who has just died is the one who threw a shoe at you every time you walked into the room, you still grieve the absence. You still, it will be strange to see someone else there. If you're very involved, or someone has had a long time, has spent a long time in the hospital, it, it is hard when that bed is occupied by some people. So never underestimate the fact that you need to be the closest. Comments? Final piece of this. How many have an advanced? Yes. I have a question. If somebody asks you the question, am I about to die? Uh -huh. What is the current wisdom on that? I think you can say to them, what do you think? And see where they are with that, especially if you just walked into the room. Um, going through, if someone says to me, am I about to die, I would probably say to them, we are really working on your comfort right now. We are not trying to, um, we're not hastening anything that's going on, but we're going to make sure you're comfortable. We're going to make sure you're not scared. Is there something that you need that I can offer? Um, can I, I would be happy to get a nurse to come in and talk to you. I don't think you need to try to tell them, well, you know, your, your breathing is depressed and you don't need that. But you can also say, we never know what we're going to die. We, we just don't have a clue. Uh, we can guess. But we're never sure. You are probably closer to your death than you are to your birth. You can't say that with certainty. And things do seem to be winding down. How can I help you talk about this? How can I answer questions that would make this easier? What is it that is worrying you most about what you're going through now? Does that make sense? I try to give, when families ask me that, they'll come in and say, how long is this going to take? You know? See, my God, for the next hour. Yeah, you can speak this up. And all I can say is that the first time I was called in, to be with someone who was dying, and it was the middle of the night, and the nursing said they're not going to be here at breakfast. 
and I came in, we talked, I sat with the family. Six weeks later, we were still sitting there. So there is no, I would hesitate to, to say, yes, you're dying. Um, I don't think I would say that. You're going to live until you die. We'll do the best that we say is God's will. And there's an unexpected death that the family thought they would last longer. And then, like, the person I was watching, and then they had gotten them ready for a right level of people. And then they're on the way in front of them. So you didn't want to be doing the process of getting the room ready while they were here. There, we never know when life's going to end. And we, um, I have walked out of the room with a family member who's been there practically a month and a month. As soon as I walk out of that room, the person is dying. If I, there are people I have thought were going to be here for much longer. And they haven't been. We can't give an exact answer to that question. Because I think what they're, if someone says, am I dying, they're asking, am I, am I going to die today? The am I dying question may have been part of the prognosis. Um, you know, there's, we cannot give you anything that's going to change the course of this disease. And so the goal is changed to live each day with as much joy as you can and to take it moment by moment. We are old. We don't get out of this life a lot. And no one knows exactly what that will happen. That would be the way I would answer that without having a whole history with that person. It's not often that I'm asked that question other than how long is this going to take? Which is a totally different thing. I think uh, most of us can wrestle with the idea that someday we're going to die, and we're okay with that as long as it's not the next half hour. So. Right, right. And most of us, when we have companioned someone through end of life, and we know that they are close to death, even when that death comes, even though we've known it. We're not ready for it right that moment. We didn't expect it that day. So, as expected as it might be, it's not expected. It's not enough time. There's never enough time. Sudden deaths are very different from the kind of preparatory grieving that goes on with the long end of life process. There is a big difference. The issue for the person in the bed is and the time frame is the same but for us who are watching and are grieving it's a very different process um, and the other thing to remember about grieving and this happens here you know, if we get 10 deaths in 13 days which has happened here um, you sort of get a deer in headlights kind of feeling and you, you're not quite sure where, where the next one is going to be, especially since you're looking this way and someone dies. And that is so unsettling and so difficult. You have to grieve each death separately. You can't layer them on top of one another. And even though some of us have a lot of experience with end of life and loss and death, Breathing. We don't get a special compensation or dispensation for knowing how to do it. Each one is personal, each one needs to be intended. Anything else? How many have advanced directives? Good for you. Have I got a deal for you? I think everybody 
from the time they can drive a car should have an advanced directive. And just because you fill it out doesn't mean you're not you're under any obligation to become unconscious so you can't advocate for yourself. <laughs> but it's important, and I've got one for everybody, to take it home and look at it. Read it. Think about it. Talk to the people you love about it. It sometimes takes four or five passes at it before you can actually sign the thing. And you should revise it every year. Or if you have a big medical event, too. But it's important, and if you have questions, there are lots of people, there are clinics to do this. When I do this at church, it takes four, average of four times looking at it. Okay? Questions? Thank you for coming. There, there are more buddies over there. They're for the road, for your shift.